Well, Chanuna my Dave, Agusta Falcher Boaf, Esmichel Lynette Fay, Falcher Gaji and Chak Nuala. Dun Chak to Blain, Asahela, Tamaj Bolliha and Shaw, Emil Farsha, Lenar Nask, Leshen Fubble Donda, Afreshi. I'm Lynette Fay and I will be your host tonight for the seventh annual Belfast International Homecoming. Now, it's been a year like no other, I don't have to tell anyone that, with the COVID pandemic hammering at our door. We lament the fact that we're more separated than ever from our diaspora and this is more um, now than at any time in living memory. But indeed we're isolated from each other and unable to un entertain our guests in uh, Belfast City Hall or Titanic Belfast as we have done in previous years. We've created brilliant memories over the years but yet the ties which bind us as a people are stronger than ever even in a global pandemic. Though not alone, we are not lonely. Though alone, rather, we're not lonely. Though isolated, we are not isolationist. And though threatened by this awful virus, we march on with the knowledge that having overcome so much here in Belfast, we will overcome the coronavirus. We will all get through this. And that strength of purpose comes not just from great courage and inspiration we get from our friends of Belfast, from around the world, but also from the exceptional individuals from other places who have made their home here. And tonight, we want to celebrate some of those people. In a world full of choices, they chose us and we are all the richer for it. So we will honour each of them as Belfast International Homecoming Ambassadors this evening in recognition of the tremendous contribution they have made to their adopted city. Though some of them have been here for quite some time, one arrived in 1962, I believe, we thought it would be nice to describe them all this evening as our new neighbours. But before I introduce you to our newly minted ambassadors, well, we're going to hear from our Belfast troubadour, an East Belfast troubadour and this has become quite the theme of the homecoming and this is our anthem we call it the spray in houston with ain't no place like home When you're down, feeling alone Wondering how you're ever gonna cope Come on, come on, come on There ain't no place like home When you're worried, feeling afraid Thinking about mistakes you made You know, you know, you know There ain't no place like home Somewhere you can go and be yourself Hey girl, hey girl, hey girl, hey girl There ain't no place like home
Tasha, special to my girl. Mila Mohigat of Rain, no place like home from the brilliant Brian Houston as ever, keeping our spirits up. Well, the increase in diversity in Belfast is being driven by a new wave of technology companies that are employers of global talent. Led by Bizarre Voice, our premier homecoming partner, these companies are weathering the COVID storm better than most. But uh, city centres, offices, may lie empty um, with their staff work from home. But they're taking the mantle of leadership at this very, very challenging time. Chief amongst those companies is Nueda, an indigenous tech trailblazing firm, which has just announced plans to employ another 200 people, which is quite some achievement at the moment. And Nueda is the sponsor of the new Neighbours section of the Homecoming. And I'm delighted to be joined now in studio by the CEO, Brendan Monaghan. You're very welcome, Brendan. Thank you very much, Lena. Well, how diverse is Nueda's workforce and what advantages has this brought the company? Uh, that's a good question. We, we employ in the wider Nueda family around about 350 uh, people. Um, I think in around about 30% of our staff um, uh, didn't originate from Belfast. Um, so in, across the company, we employ around, I think it's about 16 nationalities. Um, reason for it, very simple, um, they're great people. Um, they're very talented. They bring huge amount of diversity and value to the organization. Um, over the years, we've built a fantastic relationship, primarily with uh, Spain, uh, with an office out in Malaga. Um, and we have attracted talent from, well, you know, name a few of the countries, Portugal, Brazil, um, Russia, Italy, uh, Spain itself. So 15 nationalities is fantastic. We're very lucky. It really is. And now as we face into uncertain economic times, you have announced that you're going to almost yeah. double staff members here in Belfast. So tell me about that international okay, so, print. So we, 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 um, uh, we provide services, software development services, um, to a lot of multinational organizations, primarily in North America, um, New York, Boston, Chicago. Uh, there's plenty of companies in those, in those cities that we know us very, very well. Mm -hmm. But indeed, um, out into Asia and to um, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, primarily into financial services markets. Um, we're primarily a fintech um, company. Um, the, those markets, unfortunately, rightly or wrongly, are, are very, very buoyant. And the demand for our services at the present moment in time are, are very, are very. The drivers are very good. Um, at Belfast. Um, I, I often tell a joke about um, when I try to explain to people what it is that we do. They, they roll their eyes and uh, lose interest very quickly. But if you go to uh, the New York Stock Exchange mm -hmm. and you stand at the corner of uh, of Wall Street at the staff entrance, and if you ask one of the first ten people that come out of the organisation, have they ever heard of Belfast? Have they ever heard of New Ada? The, one of them will have heard of us. Um, you know, Belfast as a as a hub for financial services, software, particularly software engineering, is well known. We're 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 we we're right up there with the best, um, and that includes ourselves, companies like First Derivatives, companies like AquaQ. It's uh, just not just not ourselves. We're we've got we're we're well known. The way you're you're speaking, you're speaking very confidently about you know the the need for your business right now. So that obviously inspires mm -hmm. confidence for the future. Oh, very much so. Um, um, you have to back yourself. Um, um, I think we bit earlier you talked about the resilience in Belfast. Belfast's Northern Ireland people, I think, we've come through a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we're going through a lot at the present moment in time. But, but I think the experience of the last 30, 40 years in this country, this little country, uh, has proven that we can get through things. Um, so it, it's, it's still early. We're still in a, in a, in a, in a horribly uncertain time. But you know, you're maybe starting to see some glimmers of, of, of confidence coming back in. Uh, into the marketplace. And uh, I would be reasonably optimistic that as a, as a community we'll get through this. And, and particularly with the diverse uh, workforce that we have mm -hmm. and the ambassadors themselves, we'll, 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 we'll do well. We'll, 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 we'll live, we certainly will be fighting. We'll be, we certainly will be expanding. Yeah. We just need to get through the time that we have at the present moment in time. Doing our best to weather the storm while you're- Absolutely. A lot and of it, hope there and a lot of confidence for the future. Brendan, thank you very much for joining us pleasure. this evening. And uh, we're gonna hear a little bit more now about that multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-talented Nueda team. And then we will be back to meet our first batch of ambassadors. So it's about empowerment, it's about having fun, it's about recognising people's talent, it's about people giving a chance to, to develop. In the uh, first week I came here and uh, definitely uh, 
feeling of being welcome. And really, like if you work hard and you're, even if you're a graduate, you know, you can see yourself shoot up the ladder within a couple of years, you know. It allows you to meet so many different people from different areas. So you learn, you learn skills off them as well. And there's no shortage of social activities in Ueda, and whether that be just someone dropping a chat into a team channel to say, look guys, yeah, we're going to go for some drinks after work, or something more formally organised. We will continue to grow as we can continue to find good people. Uh, and we will find those good people wherever they are in the world. I think our culture is quite unique. It's about teamwork, it's about trust, it's about empowerment, it's about our customer. Fundamentally, it's about our customer. I would recommend it to family and friends because it already feels like people here are family and friends, and so I think they would fit quite well here. There's a lot of um, sharing of knowledge, a lot of collaboration, and I think to be in that sort of environment sort of pushes you to, to always sort of be looking for that improvement in yourself as well. They've been so helpful and welcoming to me uh, personally when I joined over a year ago. They've been one of the most ambitious and innovative companies I've ever worked for in my life. In three words, I would say Nueda is friendly. Communicative. Unique. It's challenging. Fresh. Innovative. Open. Um, lively. And just generally fun. And thanks again to Nueda, our sponsors for this evening's event. Well, now in this era of Black Lives Matters, we're all learning of the continued discrimination and injustice endured by people of colour, and not just in America, here as well. Our pledge at the homecoming is to continue to promote Belfast, which is not just diverse, but also which guarantees equal opportunity to all. And we draw on a rich legacy. The escaped slave and celebrated abolitionist Frederick Douglass spoke to large crowds in this very city in 1845. So we are pleased that our 10 new neighbours include activists from the black community who are carrying on the unfinished work of Frederick today. So let me introduce you to our first three local Belfast homecoming ambassadors. They are Joseph Ricketts, who is Managing Director of the African and Caribbean Support Organisation of Northern Ireland. Joseph, we'll have a big, a big wave from you in a minute. We have Sabine Kalke as project sponsor with Belfast City Council and our Commissioner for Children and Young People, who is Kula Yesuma. And welcome all three. Now, Joseph, I'm going to talk to you first this evening. Um, you have been an, in, now there you are, Joseph, hello. You're an indomitable campaigner for equality and visibility for the black community here, but as a proud son of Jamaica, it's no surprise that you're also deeply involved in promoting black music artists. So tell me about that work. Um, my work here in Northern Ireland is um, one in getting visibility for the black community and also to work with working with our new neighbors here in Northern Ireland to to um, to create home a home here for for everyone that is is diverse that is different and that is um, safe for every you know for all the people within our community and and, and our neighbors yes so the the work that I do with the music as well is also to create that sort of visibility for the black um, musicians that are in the mainstream um, here so that the the, the the, the music here in Northern Ireland can be um, can be enjoyed worldwide. Yeah, and it's more representative as well of the people who yes. live here. Um, how important then is it for groups like Acts Only to see people of colour in leadership roles, including the Northern Ireland Assembly and Belfast City Council? Uh, it, it, it's very important because as um, to have the decision making um, tables and in terms of creating a plan for the city where 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 you know it, it can showcase um, the all the people of this of this land rather than um, you know just two sides but to show that there is um, not just two sides but the uh, you know people from different um, nations and cultures yeah, and the, the, they're all here and, and part of the fabric of our community. Uh, yes. Uh, Joseph, and congratulations on becoming one of Welcome. our ambassadors this year. And on to our next ambassador and second of the evening. Uh, we should now speak to Sabina uh, Kalki. Hello, Sabina. Hello, Inez. Sabina, How are you doing? I'm great, Sabina. How are you? You came to Belfast from Germany in 2003 and you're employed mm -hmm. as a project sponsor in Belfast City Council. So that means 
you're one of the people who gets things done. But tell us how you feel Belfast is doing in terms of regeneration and what could we learn from the best practice in Germany or indeed France, where you also studied? Um, I used to work as a um, kind of um, um, project manager of a European um, network and we kind of exchange our experience with different European cities. And um, I traveled with a couple of my colleagues and um, um, politicians um, to uh, different um, um, countries and cities. And I think it was always kind of um, a learning from both sides um, because um, Belfast sometimes, or the people in Belfast sometimes um, um, don't appreciate um, how far they came already. And I always kind of um, try to tell them um, it's a beautiful country and it's a beautiful city and um, people um, from other countries can learn from Belfast as well. I think it's equally important. Oh, we don't like to take things for granted, you see, Sabine. That's what that's all about. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but, yes, uh, yeah. You're also one of Belfast's great cycling citizens. You're out on your bike an awful lot. So how important is cycling, not just to you, but to the development of our city here in Belfast? Um, active um, travel is really, really um, important here. Um, and for me, it was a little bit of a shock when I came from Berlin in 2003. Um, and I always used to cycle um, to work um, in Berlin. And I started to cycle to work here in Belfast as well. And at the very beginning, um, I think I knew all the other cyclists because there were only kind of a handful of other cyclists around. And we said hello to each other. And um, this has already changed um, partly because of um, the introduction of the Belfast bikes the public bike hire scheme, but also kind of um, the whole cultural change and um, people cycle um, a lot more here. And I think it's very, very important, especially in um, those times now. And you can see more people because of probably the pandemic, um, being outside, being a, a fresh air, trying to live healthy and um, they're out in cycling. Mm -hmm. Well, you were a trailblazer. You were there at the start, Sabine, and it's great to see more mm -hmm. people out on their bikes here in Belfast and hopefully we'll make the city um, safer for cyclists as well. Thank you very much for the moment and congratulations you. on your award. And finally, so of our first uh, group of ambassadors, we have Kula, who came from the melting pot that is London to Belfast. Um, tell us about your Greek Cypriot background and what values they, those gave you, which um, helped you make your home here. So um, anyone asks me um, where I'm from, the first answer I give is I'm Greek Cypriot, even though I was born and brought up in London, uh, just like the Irish diaspora all over the world. You know, you ask anyone, I'm. they all say I'm Irish. Yes. So I'm Greek Cypriot. Couldn't speak a word of English till I was five because I was brought up. Um, um, in a very close Greek Cypriot community um, and, and very close family. So, um, so what did so that added to living in London, which was in the sixties and seventies and eighties when, when I grew up, which was very multicultural, uh, which was very diverse, which was in, in the sixties, uh, you know, felt inclusive, even though the cracks uh, appeared uh, mm -hmm. later on. Uh, so what I what I bought and what what attracted me to living here in Northern Ireland was family, community, um, and and just being together. That's that's what what attracted me. I can't pretend the whole divided island thing wasn't familiar either. So um, yeah, that's that's what brought me here. And um, my when my family visit, um, when my mum visits, and, and previously my father before he passed away. Both felt very at home um, coming coming to Northern Ireland and just loved it. Well, that's good to hear. And we're glad that they felt like that. And we're glad that you like it here so much as well. And so <laughs> that's, why you, that's why you're one of our ambassadors. So you've earned universal plaudits for championing the rights of our young people. Uh, this generation is the most diverse we've ever known. But what lessons can we learn from today's young generation? Do you know, um, and, and I say this a lot, when we when we talk particularly about asylum seeking families and children and unaccompanied children, we often hear adults be less welcoming. But I have yet to meet a child in Northern Ireland, and don't forget I meet quite a lot, who say, why can't we open up our homes? Of course, there are things that are not perfect about being a child and growing up in Northern Ireland, but it, it, that whole thing about community and welcoming in 
children and young people that I've talked to want to be more welcoming, really enjoy hearing about other cultures, you know, uh, uh, drawing on what Joseph said. They understand it's not um, green and orange. It's, it's, you know, that we are multicultural and we are increasingly diverse. And that's what I've seen in the 26 years that I've lived here. I've seen this place change so much. Again, as, as Sabine said, for the better. I, I chose to come here in the early 90s. N have never regretted raising my family here. Um, you know, sometimes I have second thoughts about marrying the man, but we're still together, so that's okay. <laughs> but um, no, that's a joke. Um, but never, uh, never regretted um, no. moving here and raising my family here. So you came here in 1994? Having having been a volunteer in a cross community holiday for a couple of years beforehand, yeah, I protect the accent. I've worked very hard to keep the, the London accent, as you should, and as is your right, <laughs> absolutely. I th I'm, I'm a Tyrone woman living in Belfast. I understand. <laughs> um, but tell me about coming here in 1994 because that was a that was a big year here in our history. It was. So how how did you it feel was. to to make that move, and particularly in that year? So uh, obviously I've made the decision beforehand um, and, and we got married um, in 1994, but I actually moved over here in, in May 94. Right. And there was, my godfather said, you know, they knew you were going, so they had to, they had to have the ceasefires. So I, I, you know, I made the decision. I made the decision when, when my, uh, my now husband and I decided where we, he lived here, I, he lived in Belfast, I lived in London. We decided even during pre-ceasefires, I, I saw the the joys of being of this place, of the communities of this place. But I must admit, um, and, and I remember in 98 with, when my daughter was nine months old and promising her she would have a brighter future and a brighter um, upbringing than her father had. And that's absolutely what's happened. She, she's had more opportunities that this generation of young people have had, the, can still be better, keep myself in a job, but um, yeah, it was a great year. Um, um, and my the fact that I got married in 94 pales into insignificance with the other things that happened in this place. But we, we can always uh, you know want our young children to be better. I think we, ha we have Absolutely. to do that. We always have to aspire to be better and never um, take things for granted um, or never become complacent. But um, obviously you're full of hope for the, the younger generation that who have never known of the troubles here. Do, do you see a time where that, that becomes very much part of the past and leaves are leaves are present yeah i i really hope so I, I, you know the, our young people have never known the troubles but they do feel the consequences of the impact of it but i see in our young people when i see them campaigning for climate change when i see them campaigning for a more inclusive world um when i see them you know advocating for their own rights i am very very optimistic and i think where they lead we should follow and make that path even easier for them. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Great to chat to you. Very welcome. Great, great characters all. Congratulations to our first three ambassadors this evening. And uh, we're going to hear now from our lead sponsor, Bazaar Voice, and from our business partner, Tourism Ireland. Sandwiched between them, we have a real treat for you. Singer-songwriter Danny Larkin is the most amazing new talent, and we're thrilled to have her join us here at the Homecoming with a song inspired by those great shipyard landmarks and uh, I'll catch you after these dispatches. My name is Fritz Hess. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Executive Vice President of Research and Development at Bizarre Voice. The products that we provide allow brands and retailers to collect and understand reviews, and then they can analyze that and really understand what's working and what's not. My name is Seamus. I'm the VP of Research and Development here in Bizarre Voice Belfast. I recently joined Bizarre Voice to lead on where we are from a scale-up perspective. So what does that mean for Belfast? We're going to be hiring more people, uh, diverse career paths. We're going to be building a bigger office presence. We're going to be driving the business forward from Belfast. Bizarre Voice had a large development centre in Austin, Texas, and had a small site here in Belfast, Northern Ireland. We've recently started adding more team members and growing our team here in Northern Ireland, and also have launched a new site in Bengaluru, India. Solving for the world is different than solving for one small place. So it's an exciting place where you can learn and grow with new technologies, new people, and new innovations all the time. We need people that are open, honest, hardworking, technically sharp. We need the best and the brightest here at Bizarre Voice. So we're interested in your experience and what you bring to the conversation. So if you've got something to offer, something to give, you believe that you can help us move this business forward, please get in touch. Here I am in front of 
August Falch Arash take Emacht Nahiha Anacht. Wasn't that musical performance from Donny Larkin absolutely fantastic, I have to say. She is a new talent on me and I'll definitely, definitely be checking out more of her music after hearing that this evening. Well, we have, uh, despite the fact that everything's happening online this year, we have over 100 speakers at the conference and representatives from six continents. And uh, we're working on Antarctica for next year. Um, the great continents of Africa and Asia are ably represented by the next batch of of our new neighbours who have made an inestimable, inestimable contribution to our adopted city. Now, first up, we have Donna Nalongo Namuska of Uganda, who is a board member with LORAG and Africa House. And second in this group, we have Dr. M. Satish Kumar, Director for Internationalisation at the School of Natural and Built Environment in Queen's University in Belfast. Thirdly, Reverend Brent van der Linde, of South Africa, who is Assistant Minister of Stormont Presbyterian Church. 
And finally, last but not least, Fatuma Malin from Somalia, who is the secretary of NISA, the Northern Ireland Somalia Association, and an activist with NICRAS, the Northern Ireland Council for Refugees and Asylum Seekers. So I'll go to Donna first, who should appear as if by magic on the screen behind me. Hello, Donna. I saw you bopping away to the music there. You were enjoying Danny as much as I was, weren't you? Yes, I was indeed. Um, yeah, first of all, I'm very glad to be interviewed on such an important and momentous day um, in my life. It is a huge honor to receive the Belfast International Ambassador's Award, and I'm deeply honored by the Belfast International Homecoming and the organizers of this event. Thank you, Belfast. You're very, very welcome. Well, thank you for coming here and for choosing to come here and making it your home. So tell us about 2003. That's the year you moved to Belfast. What, why did you yes. make that decision? Uh, it was a very tough decision, uh, but uh, I made it. My beginning here was quite humble. And uh, it was just myself and my two daughters at the time. Uh, Belfast was quite quiet. Uh, less people from the ethnic minorities. But I was so lucky that uh, I settled um, near very good neighbors who made life happen. When I say made life happen, they made sure that we were safe. We made sure that we reached the institutions that uh, promoted our well-being, the education system, uh, the health system, uh, name it, uh, community groups, where uh, the kids went to interact with other people. And when well, I say to myself, you know what? Joining, get to know the people that get to know you. And that was me uh, in Belfast, 2003. And what were your aspirations when you came here? What were your hopes and dreams? Uh, my main three hopes and dreams were safety, security, and stability in simple words. And I think, I, I can't say that I achieved the everything, but it's a greater extent I feel I have. Um, I don't know if there will be uh, any room to talk about uh, the communities that I've uh, lived with, uh, within, or the kind of work that I've engaged in uh, within those communities. But I have to say, uh, you know, coming back from uh, the, where I came from, my community, uh, especially the lower Omo, has been welcoming to me. And uh, the family, we've been working interchangeably with uh, Laura, which is an aids led community founded in 1987. Uh, I've been very involved uh, to support residents and community and our neighbors uh, meeting their interests. And not only looking at myself, but as a community member, and we support people in a magnitude of uh, areas of personal development um, and also serve the community needs. Um, I'm part of the board for more than 10 years now. Each time I feel like leaving, uh, my mind tells me, come on, stay on. You still have more to do. Tell me about, um, you know, obviously you, you, you feel at home here now. You've, you have been welcomed. You have met great people and they have helped you find yourself and find your feet here in Belfast. Mm -hmm. But you still, you know, maintain that lovely connection with your, your homeland as well. So tell me a bit yeah. more about the work you do with Africa House. Um, Africa House, actually, I would say I'm a board member and I will be probably... We meet like once in a month to uh, organize and fundraise, advocate for people from the uh, African community, uh, ensuring accountability to our donors and funding uh, for resources um, and finance, financial management. But I can say that the, the organization that I've spent more time with would be Rolag and Beyond Skin, which is also a charity organization that nurture peace and processes. Um, I've been taking a very active role within those three groups, Rolla, like Beyond Skin and African House, and uh, many other actually tight organizations uh, to promote interactions uh, between cultures and promoting diversity, global education, um, going into different schools in Northern Ireland, actually a wide, school, a wide range of schools in Northern Ireland to promote uh, 
uh, diversity and integration uh, between young people, youth groups, uh, name it. And I, I have to say, you could ask me probably, how do we do that? So we've been doing that through art, through uh, global education, uh, sharing our stories, sharing our education here as well, what we've learned from others. And I think it has been a great success, all of those uh, three organizations and others are excelling in what they do. So you've, you're very, very busy, it, se it seems now, from, a, from the litany you've just given me, you keep, you keep yourself busy. There be, there yes. be, what is that you've got? What have you got there? I saw you bopping along to Danny Larkin earlier on. Tell me, that you, there, must be, there must be a love of music in there somewhere, is there? A lot of it. I, I, know, I have a drum with me. I know in African culture, uh, a drum is um, it's a kind of symbol of peace and unity. So each time there is a special gathering, I know I'm alone, but I believe I'm with everybody uh, on air. Uh, there is a peace and integration. So it's a drum here. Uh, today I don't have room to play it, but probably maybe next time I, I can, you know, make it sound. Uh, this drum has been in Stormont several times, in the community groups, in so many schools in Northern Ireland, at work, because I actually sometimes take it in work to uh, for therapy within um, staff members, you know, during our Friday moments, and we play together. Uh, are you going to play? The, are you going to play the drum uh, for us? If you want, Go why on. not? <laughs> That was Thank impromptu, you. not planned. We have to tell everyone at home. <laughs> but when the when we realised the drum was there, do you take the drum everywhere, Donna? <laughs> uh, nearly everywhere. I have drums in the car. So whenever you're telling me to start, I can just start. And that's it. Thank you very much for staying with us or for being with us this evening. Congratulations uh, for being one oh, of our ambassadors this year. Thank you. Lovely thank to speak you so to you. Much. Thank you. And second, to you too. thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. That's Donna Nalango Namuska of Uganda. And uh, now we're going to talk to our second ambassador in this group, who is Dr. M. Satish Kumar, Director for Internationalisation at the School of Natural and Built Environment at Queen's University in Belfast. Good evening to you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Now, you are self-isolating, I believe, because you've just arrived back from India after a nine-month study residency. So before we turn our attention to Belfast, tell us about the coronavirus crisis in India and your experience. I've uh, been in India for nine months, so six months in complete isolation in a hotel. Um, the coronavirus has taken the country with a storm. Uh, there is a huge increase and in spike in the positive cases, close to about 6.3 million and almost 100,000 deaths. So it is endemic in the sense that it has moved across the communities. The urban areas are much more deeply affected because of high levels of density mm -hmm. than the rural areas. So that is one of the findings that's emerging. People are going about their lives, maintaining social distance is a challenge, but you have to educate people. Uh, you are wearing the mask all the time and at least making sure that everyone has a chance to survive the pandemic. Absolutely. And how are you finding isolation? How long have you been in isolation at this point? Uh, back in India, in one place, it was almost seven, six months. And from there, we moved to Delhi and then was in isolation in Delhi for about a month and a half. My goodness, that's 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 tough going. But uh, you're back in Belfast now, and are you, are you relieved uh, in a way to to be to be back? Yes, absolutely relieved to be back, and very happy to be back. Well, you are an authority on South Asia, and in particular on the links between Ireland and what is now the world's largest democracy in India. So, tell us um, how you think the study of these historic links is relevant to our work of building a better Belfast today. I think in terms of uh, building up the links between countries, we have to focus on the cultural links and the historical links. And we have, I had the privilege of studying and understanding this incredible link between India and Northern Ireland, which somehow never gets reported. And just to give you some examples, 
We have one of the earliest historical links between North Malin and India from Lord Dufferin, who was the Viceroy of India in the 1800s, 1897, 98. And we had the opportunity to see that some of the work established by Lord Dufferin, uh, particularly Lady Dufferin's uh, medical missions and the Zenana schools uh, have been very successful, still continues today in terms of that legacy. The second, of course, is the lady from Dunganen, Margaret Noble, who actually went to India in 1895. She met uh, Swami Vivekananda in 19, 1895, arrived in Calcutta in 1898 and spent time working for India's freedom movement, for home rule movement and for women's education. So that was absolutely enormous in terms of what she did. She joined, uh, she had this whole idea of free Ireland and home rule movement of Ireland, Ireland, Ireland that she supported. And uh, in the sense that she carried those principles right across India, fought for the, for the movement, even the Indian national flag was designed by her at one point of time. But there's another interesting uh, information that Lord uh, Swami Vivekananda uh, actually had a meeting with Lord Kelvin of Belfast and talked about the, the Samkhya theory of energy and matter, which is again, a very little less known fact about this historical links. In the same time, we also find that Sir Robert Cavan was the governor of Bombay in 19, 1719. He was from Belfast, a multilingual person, and spent a lot of time working in the East India Company and built up an enormous amount of fortune, which was bequeathed to the uh, Londonderry family. Mark was a Londonderry, and almost all of that uh, province was built from the support of Lord uh, Sir, Sir Robert Cavan. But along with that, we also know that uh, James Mackey and Sons in 1858 established the innovation and entrepreneurship, the largest employers in Belfast had the textile missionary in India. And I wanted to put in record that it was indeed Mackey's became the first philanthropic forerunner of Warren Buffett by handing over the entire family-based company to the Indian workers when they left and set it up as a cooperative. Again, unique from the contribution of Northern Ireland. We also have examples, uh, I found links of Sir Edward Carson to the Indian Freedom Movement, which I'm researching now, mm -hmm. but also interesting to see the, the links between uh, the Sinn Féin policy and his pamphlets, how they were distributed in India over the period of time. We also had the Swadeshi Movement, the, the self-rule Swarajya Movement, Swadeshi Movement, and the links that are being, dis were being discussed in India around this time. So enormous historical links between Northern Ireland, Ireland, and India. Yeah, I, I knew about Margaret Noble because I'm from Dungannon myself, but I didn't know about the, the, much of the, the rest of what you're, you're talking about there. So how has that history helped you to settle in here in Belfast and make you know the city your home? Yes, in fact, when I came to in, uh, Belfast, it was in the December of 1999, just before the millennium. And at that point of time, the peace process was just being established. Mm -hmm. And coming from a country like India with its largest democracy in, in the world, functional democracy, but at the same time, a country which has seen partition and has gone through the partition. So for me, realized that, you know, uh, it is very important to have for a prosperous uh, community, a harmonious society to exist and education plays a huge role. And I invested all my, my entire working life in the higher education sector, trying to promote the importance of education, to promote the global identity of Northern Ireland and to encourage my youthful students to connect to the global world from that period. So that was what I did. And at the same time, I tried to provide the students with a sense of purpose for the city, for the, for the city, for the place they come from. And to really imbibe that, to see how they can reimagine the city for the future. Mm -hmm. So I established the Young Civic Leaders of Northern Ireland. That was one of my initiatives. I also made sure that students were able to participate in most of the uh, urban development programs set up by the Belfast City Council to engage with it directly as a youth. And at the same time, understanding what are the established links for peace that we can all participate together. So the Gandhi King Ikeda exhibition that I organized enabled people in Northern Ireland to really appreciate the contributions of Martin Luther King, um, Mahatma Gandhi, Ikeda, others, all the world global peace philosophers, how we can all work together. So in a sense, it has been really a privilege to be here in Northern Ireland to really understand that we have a lot to offer. And almost, as I would say, if you look at almost all the NGOs, global NGOs, national NGOs, 
the amount of work they are doing across the world, the developing world is enormous and we should celebrate success. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for speaking to us this evening with such passion and congratulations on becoming one of our ambassadors this year, Dr. Kumar. Gurumayagat and Womacha, thanks for the moment. Um, now on to our next recipient in this group, who is the Reverend van der Linde. And after uh, growing up in Cape Town, South Africa, you may have been forgiven for avoiding the whole area of conflict resolution and peacemaking here. <laughs> but in fact, it has defined your time here in Belfast, and you've gained enormous respect for your work um, on healing the wounds of the past. So tell me a little bit about that work. Yeah, so thank you very much for, for having me. Um, do you know, if I look at my, my time in, in, in Northern Ireland and with Belfast, I had the immense privilege of people, local people, inviting me into their homes and their houses and sharing their stories with me. So in many ways, I, I feel like I was a, a witness to to loads of great stories of, of, of both of triumph, but also of healing and hurt. So um, part of our work in Northern Ireland, uh, with mediation in Northern Ireland, um, that's what I did most of the time and couldn't continue to do that as, as a minister in, in Belfast. Well, we're very lucky to have you here as well, working as a minister in Belfast. And you find that most helpful in your orientation here in Belfast was none other than uh, the much loved and sadly missed Jerry Anderson, a former yeah, colleague of yeah. my own. Tell me about your relationship oh, with the, the bile <laughs> Jerry, as we like to call him. Oh, dear, I guess, um, obviously, I used to have the radio on. And after Stephen, Stephen mm. and Jerry Anderson came on the radio, and I used to listen to that from, I used to stop on the side of the road, I used to laugh so much <laughs> at the, some of the things he used to get up to and some of the things he said. It's funny, it's one of those things that really got me to understand uh, the culture in Northern Ireland. You know, I used to laugh at myself and discover people's jokes. And, and I, I, I sometimes I have to ask my wife, what does that mean? You know, so I actually love that show, you know, and I would still go back to YouTube and listen to some of the stories and still laugh today. You know, I was showing my daughter some of those clay um, cartoons that he, that's now made with some of his calls. Really funny. So, yeah, I love that. It was part of my culturization of Belfast. It, it absolutely was. And he's, he's looking down on you and he is smiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did you appreciate his choice of music? Uh, um, well, sometimes it was interesting. It was interesting, <laughs> you know. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I could have said that. It was interesting. Um, yeah. Brilliant. He would absolutely, he would just absolutely love that. And I, I'm just interested, you yeah. know, yeah. And coming to this country and listening to the way we yeah. speak and the way we speak English, yeah, yeah. it's it's not yeah. easy to navigate your way through that. And some of the callers who called Jerry Anderson, like Fonzie and oh, yeah. um, Jordy as well, my goodness. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and his relationship with Sean as well was just amazing. You know, that's worked really, really well. You know, um, I even miss hearing Sean on the radio and all, you know. Um, but yeah, so I, I really enjoyed that. It was definitely a highlight of my of my week. <laughs> that, that's incredible. Coming the whole way to Belfast and developing a love of Jerry <laughs> Anderson and Sean Coyle. I'm sure. To, um, yeah. Did you ever meet him? No, I didn't. I didn't. In fact, I just, it just made me think about you know, it. was a two year stint that I moved back to South Africa. And you know what? I would actually listen on, on the internet to Jerry and to Sean. That's how committed I was. <laughs> Well, very, very committed indeed. Thank you very much for the minute yeah. and uh, congratulations on becoming yeah. one of the, the ambassadors this year. And finally yeah, now, in this group much, yeah. of ambassadors, we'll go to Fatuma Malin the, from Somalia, who is the secretary of NISA, the Northern Ireland Somalia Association and an activist with NICRAS, the Northern Ireland Council for Refugees and Asylum Seekers. Hello, Fatuma. Welcome. Hello. I Thank hope, you very much. Hope you're well this Thursday. So you're one of the yes. best known individuals fighting for the dignity and rights of asylum seekers and refugees in Belfast. So tell us about the work you do in this community. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organizer, organizers. Thank you for Belfast International Hope for coming, for organizing me for the work that I do within the community. I, I do this out of passion. I never expected or uh, thinking that I'll get an award. I do appreciate it. And I want to pass my congratulations also to the other ambassadors. I know some of them, uh, Donna, Joseph, I work many times with them. So part of the work I do is support, represent, aspire 
and work uh, for a better tomorrow for refugees and asylum seekers. I am cur currently the secretary of Northern Ireland Somali Association, and I do a lot of advocacy within my community. Uh, I've worked also with Africa House, who represent the African diaspora, um, uh, who come to here in Northern Ireland. And um, as Laura, uh, Donna said, um, I've been very closely linked with LORAC as well. And LORAC has given me a warm welcome within the Lower Omo. I've been living in this side of the Lower Omo since over five years. And um, I've been, I was one of the activists of, uh, I was one of the um, active citizen for LORAC as well. So that meant that whenever a new person comes, especially from my community, I'll be able to speak to them and language being uh, a biggest barrier. Uh, they don't speak English. Uh, English isn't our first language. Uh, currently working with um, Northern Ireland Community for Refugees and Asylum Seekers. And part of my work, especially with this pandemic, um, we had a project which was a collaboration with different organizations that represents the refugees and asylum seeker. The project was called CRAC, which is CRAC, I know, <laughs> CRAC, which is a COVID response for refugees and asylum seekers. And part of it, we were able to give um, some amount uh, for single asylum seekers because the amount they normally receive isn't enough. We've been giving food parcels and taking delivering to their own home. Um, I was one of the people who was um, on the helpline, putting the information down and passing on to the volunteers. And we've done um, a collaboration with Storehouse, um, Food Bank, uh, Round, uh, South Belfast Roundtable, Embrace. It was one of the things that, uh, the positive that came out of this uh, pandemic was the, the, we worked, we never thought those all those organizations will come together. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice to bring all the um, organization that represents uh, the same people coming together and helping the same people uh, had one goal of giving them the very best over this duration that we were at. And has that reaffirmed your belief in you know, Belfast as a place where you see these organizations coming together to really help people in their time of need, because no more need now than a, a global pandemic. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so one of the, I, I don't remember her name, but she mentioned she was one of the, the three speakers who spoke. She did mention how she came from London and uh, came to Belfast. I was one of them actually, who came from London uh, to Belfast. And initially uh, people scared me, you go into Belfast, you know, I didn't know the history, <laughs> the travels and everything. But now living, I've proved them wrong that Belfast is a lovely, lovely place, a friendly people who want to know about you, who are interested as to why you're here. And I call Belfast home. I've had my children here and I don't intend to move from Belfast. Oh, Fatuma, that's lovely. Love, really lovely <laughs> words. Thank you very much for those. And congratulations thank, thank on becoming one of the ambassadors this year as well. <laughs> Thank you. So, Kogardahas Leshnah Ambassadori, like congratulations to all our ambassadors in this group. And uh, you heard Dr. Reverend Van der Linde touch on um, our troubled times there. And one of our esteemed singer songwriters, Joby Fox, captured the pain of our past and our undimmed hopes for the future in his monumental hit, Belfast. So, let's hear from some of our sponsors and we'll hear Joby before I introduce you to our next group of ambassadors.
Belfast How I know you so well You're like You're like hell like I come from a family of ten uh, from West Belfast Five brothers, four sisters We were a happy family when I was 17, I joined a band called The Bank Rovers. We were quite well known in Belfast. We got a contract with EMI Records and went to London. I wrote the song Belfast when I was in The Bank Rovers. It was the first song that I'd ever wrote and it was overlooked. But many years later, when it was in Energy Orchard and living in London and signed AMCA Records, it was picked up again by someone in the record company. And it was the first single off our first album, Energy Orchard. I went to number 48 in the British charts and went to number one in Ireland. So it got great exposure all over the world. I toured Europe, America. A lot of people say that it's uh, the unofficial anthem for the city. In 69, when the troubles came, I was only eight years of age. And it devastated my family, devastated a lot of families. At that age, I wasn't very, uh, aware of the political situation but I was I was able to pick up on the atmosphere around me and I knew that uh, there was something terribly wrong so anybody over the age of 30 or roundabouts always remembers this song obviously because it was named Belfast and again the troubles were raging the whole time in the background it was kind of lodged in their psyche from that point onwards Originally, it only had two verses. When the flag issue happened, I thought that I'd read a third verse, but a more optimistic verse. Well, the only way we're going to be free from the darkness is really by working together and uh, moving towards, move towards what? Thank you. 
Now, we are very pleased to announce that the charity partners of this year's Belfast Homecoming are the Community Foundation of Northern Ireland and they have launched a COVID appeal. We're trying to raise £2,000 this evening and uh, it would be great if you could go online and donate what you can to the Belfast at belfasthomecoming.com belfasthomecoming.com and uh, donate what you can there. I see uh, a few messages coming in on social media as well. Uh, Neil Flanagan is saying wonderful. Thank you, Joby and all. Also, good appreciation for the wonderful music from Joby Fox. So keep your messages coming into us and uh, we'll give you a mention before the end of proceedings this evening. Now, Neil Shawcross is uh, the Visual Artist Laureate of Belfast. He's a supremely gifted painter with a common touch. And as a teacher at the Belfast School of Art since 1962, he played an invaluable role in developing several generations of our finest artists. So his work is as much part of Belfast as the Lagan itself and his series of striking portraits of Belfast characters is as important to us as the works of Lowry are to Lancashire. So we called into his Belfast studio where he continues to work daily between swimming in the sea and playing tennis to chat with Ambassador Shawcross. Friends in Belfast sent me a cutting from the Belfast Telegraph advertising for part-time uh, lecturing post in painting. Yeah. So I arrived, I was offered hours and that was January 62. So I've been here almost 60 years so uh, I'm a blowing but not not to 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 uh, short. Uh, I'm loving being here full time. Everyone is interesting. Everyone have a, has a story and a background that is interesting. Ireland hasn't a national portrait gallery. They've got national galleries, but not a national portrait gallery. And I'd love them to be part of an establishment of a national portrait gallery. I see young people graduating and renting studios, doing what they love. They're answerable to no one. People setting up little ceramic studios or design studios and they may never be what they uh, would call well off in terms of money, but they're richer than most people. The arts are the best thing you can be in for your health and state of mind. <laughs> The wonderful Neil Shawcross there and as he said everyone has a story and indeed we are hearing so many interesting and really intriguing stories this evening and we're grateful for everyone for sharing their individual stories with us doesn't it make the tapestry so richer so much richer and our final two neighbours and Belfast homecoming ambassadors this evening both left their mark on Belfast city and on this region and though their paths are very different we suspect the same values of community service unite them first up is Barbara Snowarska she is the founder member of the Polish Association of Northern Ireland. And secondly, we have Mr. Khalid Khan, who is a plastic surgeon at the Royal Victoria Hospital and a world leader in the treatment of life-changing burn injuries. But uh, first to Barbara, and hopefully she'll appear on my screen. There you are, Barbara. Good evening to you. Well, you have- To no no my, my who hen. And unfortunately, I can't, I can't reply to you in Polish. I'm sorry about that. Um, You've been gracing us with your presence since 2005 and in that time you've championed your Polish community but you set up the first Polish school here in 2007 so tell me about the importance of that of um, I suppose celebrating your traditions and your place uh, of birth here. Yes it was very very important to me uh, at the time I had only one son uh, and he was uh, quite young he was only uh, four and uh, there were lots of people coming to Polish Association Northern Ireland at the time and asking about if there is going to be a school of some sort for kids and there was a um, kind of a meeting of parents interested and I got involved and it was easier for me probably than for so many other parents uh, to uh, kind of 
be involved in organization of this because of my English mm -hmm. skills and uh, and for lots of people it was a barrier. So I I I you know I, the school started and we had right away we had about seventy kids. Uh, the following year we had over hundred. So um, that was really important because um, language uh, is. Um, you know, we, we are not single identity people. Generally, we are always a mix of different identities mm -hmm. of places where we have been for a long time, which we are attached to emotionally. But language is something which can be seen as a problem, can be seen as a right. And uh, and it's best when it's seen as a resource. It's something that we need really uh, for um, lots of things, uh, but also it's part of something that builds our identity too and gives us connections to the world around us to our uh, for my you know for my kids it's my grandparents uh, their uh, their, their grandparents their cousins and, and mm -hmm. you know family so um that was re really important i remember someone saying once that um the different languages of the world make the uh, menu all the more delicious and I think it's a, it's a great analogy because that's exactly what it does. If we were eating the same thing, it would be very, very boring, um, Barbara. But um, tell me about the sense of community that creating the Polish school, um, that that helped create and keeping the, the Polish community together whilst trying to settle down in a new place. Yes, I think for Polish community, uh, actually the schools, Polish Saturday schools very often serve as a sort of a centre for community. Yeah. And and although not everybody uses uh, that center because they don't have kids, um, uh, but they get involved and there are other events that can be attached to the school and that can be kind of more open form to everybody and you can kind of um, uh, offer much much more kind of support. Um, uh, and, and at the moment there are you know over a dozen schools, some smaller, some some bigger, all around Northern Ireland. And there are two in Belfast actually. Um, and uh, and it's not just about Polish, you know, because we keep links and we share our experiences with other schools, other kind of minority language schools. There's a Bulgarian school, there's uh, two Russian schools, actually. There, <laughs> there's even a French uh, mother tongue uh, school as well. So that's something that I hope it's going to, to grow uh, because I think people, as the time goes on, they just see that. Um, those la language, uh, mother tongue is kind of eroding unless you really invest in it. Uh, so, but we do other projects obviously uh, in connection and my involvement is at the moment with Polish language culture and affairs that runs one of the schools and also another community organization, which is a Polish uh, sisterhood, which is more like a women support a group for women, mainly in greater Belfast. So we do different projects, which, um, uh, which are within kind of health and well-being, and this is in partnership with some uh, statutory bodies or some other organizations, uh, uh, you know, like like us. Um, so we did, uh, we we got involved in one project which which was creating a leaflet in Polish about uh, good diet and also importance of uh, being active. Uh, there was uh, a survey done on needs of older people, so we hope to start something for older people as well. Uh, in our community. Um, uh, there was lots of walking projects over the lockdown period. <laughs> I feel, I, exactly, how has, the, how has the lockdown period and the COVID-19 pandemic affected the, the Polish community? Yeah, that was one thing that I noticed uh, that uh, because we don't have a, a, a premises as such as a community, you know, kind of place where we could meet. Uh, which, of course, during lockdown wasn't a problem because <laughs> we wouldn't, have, you know, be able to meet anyway. But our presence is very much virtual, mm -hmm. kind of online, and uh, it's quite vibrant. I would say there are so many groups on Facebook that kind of, you know, there's a lot. You ask a question about help me with this, and and there are lots of people who would help. But I became aware that there is a group of people that are completely, you know, they don't have this, those digital skills. Um, uh, they don't even have Facebook. They don't have anything. It's, there's really need, I see, for um, having something that that could, as well, you know, uh, 
There's more yeah. of a more of a community yeah. outreach needed. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely, and I think that affects a, a, a number of communities where maybe some people don't have the digital skills, for sure. Um, looking <coughs> a f looking ahead to the future, you know, there's an awful lot of uncertainty out there at the minute, Barbara, especially with the pandemic. But then we have the B word raising its head again, as in Brexit. Um, how will that affect the the Polish presence in Belfast, or how do you see that panning out? Um, I don't think it's going to affect uh, the Polish community in a way that lots of people will leave or anything like that. I don't think so. Uh, I think it's pretty much settled, you know, the numbers uh, of people. Some, you know, may may decide to leave, but I don't think it will. Let's see, you know, because uh, there was uh, in next year there will be another census, yeah? <laughs> so uh, we will see, but the last census showed that there are officially around 18,000, but we already knew that uh, probably closer to 25,000 people. Yeah. Um, uh, so n next year it will really show, but I think it's not really affecting in a... Not just huge, yet. Huge way. Yeah. Not just yet, so we'll see. Um, Barbara, thank you very much for the moment and congratulations on your award. How does it feel to be an ambassador of Belfast? Oh, it's, it feels great. I, I really feel so honoured. Um, and I hope there'll be more uh, people uh, next year as well, because the, I, I know there are lots of people who, who could be honoured. Yeah, oh, they, they want the medal. That's all, all they want, Barbara. They just want the bling. It's all about the bling. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And now we have our final uh, recipient is Dr. Khan. So we have Mr. Khalid Khan, plastic surgeon at the Royal Victoria Hospital and world leader in the treatment of life-changing burn injuries. Good evening to you, uh, Mr. Khan. You're very welcome. And you're one of the most esteemed plastic surgeons and you've worked to help victims of violence, including the victims of the Oma bombing to rebuild their lives. How did your homeland of Pakistan prepare you for this stellar career? Um, <coughs> um, um, I, uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for giving me this honor. Um, I um, feel uh, that I really did not do anything out of ordinary to deserve this because I just did my duty. Now, going back to your question, uh, the country of my origin, I really did not spend much time there. Uh, so I got trained here in this place. I got trained in Belfast by some of the best uh, plastic surgeons. And during the years of the trouble, um, I um, got my training and then I gave the service back to the community. But in fact, I used that uh, experience to go around the world in um, areas of conflict, um, man-made or, or, or natural disasters like earthquakes. Um, uh, some very close friends, uh, staff, junior doctors and nurses travel with me around as well. So I have used that experience um, everywhere uh, around the world. And I still, um, apart from uh, training people here, I'm involved in training people back home in Pakistan um, uh, for the treatment of burns and, um, uh, and other uh, natural disasters as well. It's a really, really important job. Um, and I'm sure it's one you, do, you don't take lightly with great responsibility. And I suppose in the last few months, the pandemic has really highlighted the importance of our health service to all our lives. Um, and it's a service none of us take for granted, um, particularly not now. Um, but it has also highlighted the under-resourcing of the HSC or the NHS. Um, as you prepare for retirement, what advice would you give to those in power who sincerely want to transform our health service? Um, I, I think uh, th there is so much in the pot for healthcare and uh, to be honest, uh, NHS does uh, uh, provide better service than many other countries uh, around the world. Uh, but as the population grows, the needs of the people and the diseases like this epidemic uh, come out of nowhere. No money, no resource is enough to deal with it. Um, uh, so I, I, I personally, uh, my uh, personal uh, advice and, and towards the end of my career uh, would be real to Westminster really, uh, rather than somebody local here, that um, less management uh, and empowerment of those uh, who provide those services the way it used to be. Advice from you there.
um, Dr. Khan, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Khan, for joining us this evening. Congratulations on your award as an ambassador. It's uh, richly deserved. And thank you for your kind words as well at the beginning there. Um, and that brings uh, this evening to a conclusion. Kogarja has slash and ambassador Yelig Augustus Sulagam Anish Awachinasul, Gajuki Shid Liganis, Aaron Skylan, or Mahul. I hope now with the magic of technology we will have all our ambassadors who are with us this evening. Everyone's joining us live and uh, they might join us on uh, the magic wall behind me. Thanks very much to all our partners who have uh, been in uh, involved with the Belfast Homecoming as well and made all these events possible. There they are. There's some of them. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello again. You've been sitting there very, very patiently and uh, very uh, quietly there all evening. Um, <laughs> and the drums are still going. I hear, I hear the drum. Joseph Ricketts, can I just come back to you for a final word, please, this evening? Yes. Joseph, okay. we just want to ask about, uh, we mentioned Frederick Douglass and his links with Belfast there in the 19th century, a little earlier on. Can you tell me about the plans to celebrate him here in Belfast? Why are they important? Um, Frederick Douglass is a very important figure in the um, ab abolitionist movement as a, and also as a social reformer. Um, uh, he's, he's, there's going to be a statue being um, erected in, in Belfast for Frederick Douglass. But we want to know that there is more than just a statue, but there is a um, genuine conversation around um, equality and diversity. Um, we're also, in terms of looking at reforms in, in schools around education, in looking at um, the you know, so, a social reform and how we can, um, we, we can achieve a better outcome here in Northern Ireland. The, the, the Frederick Douglass conversation resonates with our work because in terms of social reform, now that we're going through the Black Lives Matter um, issues at the moment, that's uh, what the committee is asking for is social reform in area of um, in, in race relations um, where we can challenge um, things like racism on, on the ground, um, institutional racism, things like racism in school, challenging racism online, challenging racism in the workplace. So um, there's a lot of reform and conversation to be held across uh, across all, all departments, across all workplace uh, in, in, in terms of making Northern Ireland a, a racism free zone. And where would you advise anyone to, to start that conversation? You know, are you directing them to, to the work that you do with Axoni? Is that a good place to start? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, work going on at the moment um, in the communities. Um, there's a lot of uh, groups and, and communities working on the ground. Um, there's the, at the racial equality subgroup. There is conversations going on as well. Uh, we work um, through the communities and through the racial ra racial equality champions can can work to have that uh, sort of uh, joint up approach to, to to deal with the matter. But we need more more of the leaders to engage with us to engage with the community, to engage with each other, and, and also starting a conversation at home as well. Mm. Um, that we need to stamp racism out at its root and, 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 and create a, a racism-free um, zone here in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I think everybody has the responsibility to start the conversation and definitely carry it on and be part of it. Thank you very much for your contribution this evening. Congratulations again on becoming okay, one of our ambassadors. Sure. And uh, congratulations to all the ambassadors indeed. Um, and uh, they might come up on the wall again behind me now as I will say our farewell for this evening. Sadly, we couldn't be together in person in the one room celebrating tonight. We will just put that on hold. And I'm sure that um, the ambassadors tonight, the ambassadors of 2020, will be invited to a real party very, very soon. And if the characters... Um, <laughs> there we go. That, that, des that deserved a beat of the drums. <laughs> And if the characters here that have been on the wall behind me tonight, I'm telling you, if those personalities come through for real in a room, we are going to have some nights crack. <laughs> so, Gramila Mayak of Alig Agus Kogarjahas, thanks very much to each and every one of you. So, no, Ihawai, Ihawai Agus, thank you very much. And as opposed to leave tonight, no group captures the contribution of our new communities to the city of Belfast more than Arts Exta and their annual Mela Fest.
festival, as with so many other events, very sadly had to go virtual this year. It's usually just a brilliant day in Botanic Gardens. But under the leadership of Nisha Tandon, Mela has proved to be our premier celebration of diversity. So there's no better way to end tonight's section of the Belfast International Homecoming than to remind ourselves of the great jewel and the cultural crown of Belfast that is Mela. So I hope to see you back online tomorrow night at, or tomorrow morning rather, at 8am for a full day of discussions, debate and dispatches. I will see you tomorrow night for the big event at uh, six o'clock. But to wish you good night, here is a Mela taster. Ehoi. <laughs>